stuff. So, uh, what is your name and where are you, where are you from? <laughs> uh, my name is uh, Tony Gonzalez and I'm from Brownsville, Texas. Uh, uh, fairly small uh, South Texas border town, southernmost of Texas. Um, as you know, <laughs> I'm uh-huh. from the same place. Yeah. Um, so I was born and raised in Brownsville and uh, eventually left uh, to come to school here at UT Austin. Mm-hmm. So I was actually here as an undergrad and <laughs> I've never left. <laughs> you know, got my PhD here. And uh, yeah, but that, that's, that's my name, that's where I'm from. Uh, so what made you want to pursue a career in biology? Like, did you know coming into UT that that's what you want to do? Not at all. Did someone convince you? <laughs> uh, I wouldn't say anybody convinced me, but uh, um, I, I've never been, I guess I've never been one of those ones who kind of always knew what I wanted to be, like mm-hmm. from an early age, or I had like this dream. I was always kind of very interested in, in science, or even more general than that, I was always very interested in like knowing the facts or knowing the truth, uh, knowing what the answers were. That was just ridiculously important to me, even as a kid. I had to know what you know the band, like the big questions. Like you know, I wanted to, to kind of uh, know what that was. Mm-hmm. And so I grew up in Brownsville, and I went I went to Catholic school. So growing up uh, in Brownsville, you know, especially in the '80s, there's not a lot of sciences down there, and uh, I grew up very Catholic, and so, ironically, for a second, not for very long, but as a kid, maybe seven, eight years old, my mom still tells the story wistfully, I wanted to be a priest, Catholic priest, (laughs) because to me, in that part of the country, Mm -hmm. those were the scientists in a way. They were the ones who had all the answers. They knew how the universe began, they knew how it was gonna end, they knew where we came from, where we're going, and I'm like, that's what I wanna know, that's what I wanna do. But I quickly realized that (laughs) Um, those aren't exactly quite the answers I was thinking about. And so my, my kind of introduction or my scientific upbringing down there was more like through movies and books, you know, like so, you know, uh, Dr. Alan Grant in Jurassic Park, Dr. Indiana Jones, you know, they, these were the things that, so I didn't think science was a realistic career because it almost seemed like a fake thing to me. Uh, it was something I didn't see. I didn't know any scientists growing up. Um, so I didn't. So I, I was interested in, in, in science in that sense at a very young age. I did kind of do science stuff, and, 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 and my parents, my dad in particular, were very supportive of like, you know, of, of like my scientific interest. I had a microscope when I was a kid. I got it for Christmas one year. I really wanted a microscope so I could put the the Rosaka water under the <laughs> under the, the, the lens and uh-huh. look at all the stuff. So I kind of always had these in- interests and. Um, and, and I, I didn't really know, I, I couldn't really say at an early age, I want to be a geneticist, because, you know, like I said, I didn't even know what that meant, nor did I have any kind of role model, so to speak, in that immediate environment. Um, so what really made the difference was coming to a place like UT. And then it was like, oh, wow, here are all the people that I thought were just almost like fictional, but here they are, and they're really excited, and they're better than like in the movies, <laughs> and, they, and they are living, breathing people, and I can learn from them, and they can teach me, and so when I got to UT, um, that was really uh, kind of a, a, an important moment that helped me realize. I still did a lot of wandering when I was here and I didn't quite figure it out till late. But it began to show me that there are people who do spend their lives and it is possible to, to have this career of, of a scientist. Um, and it is possible and, uh, and, uh, and I was in the right place and I was learning from them. So, so that was important, uh, coming here and seeing that. And then after that, no one really kind of convinced me. I just kind of kept at it here at UT. Um, uh, you know, I read a lot of cool books while I was here about biology and, and science, kind of like extracurricular type stuff. And it, it just made me more and more want to be a scientist. <coughs> and then late in my undergraduate years, I, I got a, a, a volunteer research position in a, in a plant genetics lab. And that really was the moment that, that, mm-hmm. that it was kind of like where you've been all my life kind of experience like this is what I wanted to do and I almost graduated without having that experience I don't know what I would be doing if it weren't for that really accidental kind of serendipitous moment where I managed to start doing research in somebody's lab Um, but even that didn't kind of super solidify it because then I graduated I only was able to do that for about a year and then I graduated and I just did lab tech jobs for like two years 
And then I was encouraged to go back to grad school. I always knew I wanted to go to grad school, but the guy I was working for at the time, Dr. Alan Lloyd, said, you need to go back to grad school. Because you can't lab tech your whole life. It's like a dead end. It's just kind of a temporary. Uh -huh. It's kind of like just something you do between, let's say, undergrad and going to professional you know, school or grad school. So, um, so I had a really good mentor in Dr. Lloyd, the other guy I was working for at the time, and the guy I got my PhD under uh, eventually. So he was also instrumental in kind of pointing me in the right direction and making me do the things that I wasn't doing because I was kind of lazy. <laughs> I was just enjoying myself in the lab, but I had to go back to grad school. So, so yeah, that was all kind of very important and I didn't really have it figured out at all. And uh, it wasn't until very kind of late in the game that, uh, that I kind of uh, more or less by accident kind of found this, this calling, if you will, this, this kind of uh, this career. So could have gone bad, I guess. <laughs> Um, when you first started here at UT, was biology something that just clicked in your head? Or did you find it very difficult to comprehend at first? Uh, what was like the most challenging thing about biology for you? <coughs> the most challenging thing about when I got here at UT, uh, maybe wasn't specific to biology, but more like specific to being here at UT was um, time and like just the regular things I get to. So I, I, I would. Didn't have, no one was making me go to class. Uh, I could I could sleep in. I could skip classes, and I was really so I was really bad. Uh, I was a really bad college student. I did not play the game of college very well for a while. Um, so I mentioned that when I went to school in, in Brownsville, I went to uh, a Catholic school uh, called St. Joseph's College Preparatory Academy, and the the that is still to this day some of the most rigorous academics I've ever engaged in. Like they really. You had to study. They kick you out if you didn't make the grades. Like you, wow. you know, you had to take an entrance exam to get in that school. So high school was really, really stressful. And when I got to UT, I was just done. Like I was done with the. I was almost had a chip on my shoulder. Like I, I kind of convinced myself, grades don't matter. I can fail, and I, I'm still the same person. I don't care. So when I got to UT, and I had all this freedom, my friends were up here, and I just, I just had fun. I did a lot of exploring, a lot of wandering. <laughs> I don't really regret it because I, it was necessary for someone like me. I wouldn't give this advice to everybody. It's kind of like, you know, this is, I don't tell people you should go wander and fail if, you, if they don't need to hear that. Because basically what happened is, um, and this is ironic because I got here uh, and one of the first classes I took was genetics. I came here as a transfer student. Um, so my very first semester here, I took genetics, I took biochemistry, I took stuff like that. And uh, that semester I failed genetics. I failed my genetics course. Wow. And now I'm a geneticist, so that's just kind of how it works. Uh, there's another guy here on campus who he was briefly the, the dean of the College of Natural Sciences, and now he's he got promoted and he's dean of like undergraduate studies somewhere. Uh, and he was a he's a chemist, and he failed out of his first chemistry uh, graduate program. So it's almost like the bigger you fail at something, <laughs> wow. the higher you're going to rise in that something. <laughs> so it's kind of a weird di dynamic. I don't encourage people go do this. But uh, for me, it was a necessary part of the journey. I had to like play around, I had to experiment. I had to take things on the course schedule that weren't remotely related to my degree plan just because it was interesting. Like philosophy of religion, sign me up. Classical mythology, sign me up. I took all these weird oddball courses. By the time I graduated, I had a million hours. Uh, so, so yeah, I was just a real aloof kind of student when I was here at UT. I was more interested in just kind of uh, enjoying myself, and I don't mean that necessarily in a party way. Oh, I did a little play of that too. I mean it in like an academic, intellectual way. Like it was fun to be here with all these like big brains and, and they were there for the picking. And I wanted to like learn from them. And I wanted to like just expand my mind and, and try to like stuff all this stuff in it. And uh, I just kind of wanted to do that. So grades were not important and I, I really didn't care if I failed uh, classes. And I failed them. <laughs> and and uh, I guess I guess the the silver lining there is that you can recover from almost anything. So when I see a student come in bawling because they failed this test or that test, and I'm like, oh man, you don't. You have to. <laughs> and they think their life's over. Like that's it. I failed my first exam and it's over. I'm gonna be homeless. Like that's it. Uh, no, you can you can recover from from anything. And, and uh, so so yeah, I didn't. Uh, so so. I enjoy biology. Get back to your original question, but I digress a lot. I, I enjoy biology. Um, it was difficult at times. It was more, like I said, more the rigor of the education and, and, and more the discipline that it often required to study up on all this stuff. 
I did it more like out of fun. I did it more for a hobby. So when push came to shove and it was time to like do well on exam, you know, that maybe didn't get me the, the A or the results uh, because I was more like just kind of like playing around. And, and, uh, and I remember my genetics professor, first time I took genetics, had all this extracurricular reading on the syllabus. Like, oh, you should read this book by this guy. And I read all those things. And, and to this day, I think that that genetics class that I failed taught me a ton because I read all this other stuff that the professor was pointing us towards. And I still remember it as like a really pivotal moment taking that genetic class, even though I failed it. Because I, I, it really kind of sparked my interest in genetics uh, because I, I read everything but the textbook <laughs> that was assigned for that class. And I would go into office hours and I'd talk to the TAs and they, we would talk genetics and they were all, you know, happy about that. And then they'd look me up in the grades and like, what are you, what are you doing? Like, why are you failing this course if you're reading Richard Dawkins' Selfish Gene and coming in here hours at a time to talk about it? Like, what, what's, what's, what gives? So, so um, yeah, I, what I struggled with is what a lot of students struggle with when they get here is time management, uh, staying on point, being disciplined, taking it real seriously. Uh, I didn't do any of those things very well when I was here, at least not at first. Um, uh, so yeah, so, so I like biology. I do think uh, science clicks with me on kind of some intuitive level, uh, but that's not enough uh, to be a good scientist and ultimately to succeed. You have to then, you have to study and you have to be rigorous and you have to be disciplined. You have to be hardworking. Um, you have to be tenacious, persistent. Um, but at the core, you do have to be fascinated, interested, awestruck, like a kid in a candy store. I think that's important for a scientist, and a lot of scientists feel that way. Um, so, what is your favorite? Thing about you know teaching science, you know you you say how yeah. you know, science kind of clicks in your head, and now here you are you know, influencing students. <laughs> I hope <laughs> that's my job. Um, so it was actually as a graduate student. I did a lot of teaching as a graduate student. I actually taught I taught genetics, I TA genetics, something like seven semesters. Wow. <laughs> and cell biology, like another six or seven semesters. And that teaching experience, so when you're in grad school, a lot of graduate students can grumble about teaching. Like they just want to be in the lab, they want to be working towards their dissertation, they want to be doing their research, and teaching is like this necessary evil that you have to go do, it, it, it pays the rent, you know, you have, you, have to, you have to do it. For me, uh, I think as much as the research and the mentoring I was getting in grad school to be a scientist, that was important, but as important was the teaching I was doing, it, the experience. Because again, uh, well, the first time I took, I taught genetics, like what a disaster. Like I thought, you know, I thought, ah, oh, I know genetics. I'm a grad student, I'm doing genetics in the lab. Um, you think you know it, and you do for yourself. But having to teach genetics, genetics in particular, as opposed to let's say cell biogenetics, is, there's some mental gymnastics involved with genetics. And so, and so, like, you know, fumbling my way on the chalkboard through a three-point test cross and, like, kind of just totally, you know, fouling it up until I get the right answer does the class no good. Like, they don't, you know what I mean? Like, my, my, my random, like, you know, intuitive thought process, no. So teaching was really, really instrumental for making me really learn the material, like second nature learn, like just, like I can wear it like clothes. And I needed that so I could communicate it. I had to not only explain genetics to people, but I had to maybe explain it 50 different ways to 50 different people. And it really was like, I thought I'd have it down and I'd explain it to somebody and for some people that would click and for some others it wouldn't. So, so what I found out uh, was that teaching made me a far better scientist and being a good teacher made me a far better scientist. Because it really gave me that deep, deep knowledge um, that you almost can only get when you have to teach it. Mm -hmm. You know, you kind of can read something, you can kind of think you know it, and maybe you do in some way for yourself. But then you have to like explain it, and and it all just falls apart. And you realize, wow, my my, my grasp on this subject matter is kind of slippery. I don't have it down the way I thought I did. And, and, and there's nothing like teaching to bring that in sharp relief to, to show you that, oh wow, I really don't know this stuff as, as well as I thought. Because you really can be convinced that you kind of know this stuff. Um, but you don't until you teach it. So I really like teaching almost from a, from a selfish perspective was because of what it did for me. Like what it, how it made me kind of like a, a, a better thinker about the material. 
uh, more knowledgeable about the material. Um, and that translated later in, into the, into the, at the bench, at the, the research bench. I just kind of had it all there. Um, and I could, you know, draw quicker conclusions or whatever. <coughs> so in one way, um, I like teaching uh, because of what it kind of did for me. Uh, now, I just like teaching, uh, especially in the lab where you get to like, it's not like a classroom environment, it's like a work environment. And it's not like I'm the, the teacher, you're, I'm the authority, you're the, you know, I'm going to judge you, I'm here to give you exams. It's like collaborative and we're working in the lab and we're talking. And, and, and that's where, um, that's one of the things I also lamented about genetics when I was teaching it as a grad student was like, you know, of course everyone in the class is asleep and not paying attention. Because this stuff is kind of boring sometimes if you don't have the lab part. If you're not doing things with your hands, you're not playing around, you're not seeing stuff. So in the lab, all the questions come organically from the students. They're, they're just, they have a question because they literally are, have something in their hands or they're running a gel or they're purifying DNA and they have a question. Like, what does this solution do? Why am I adding it? Or why is it this much? Or, oops, I just dropped my sample. <laughs> like, what, uh, you know, what do I do now? And so it's this more organic kind of, uh, like, you know, pure ideal learning environment. So I love that. I just kind of thrive on that. And, um, and so that, and that's what research is. Research is like the purest form of teaching. So there's like this dichotomy of teaching and research. They're really the same thing. I mean, all science is done by students, first of all, grad students and stuff. So, so, so I think there's no better way to teach and be a teacher, at least in the sciences, than to do it through research. So they're, they're, they're kind of uh, the same, different sides of the same coin, maybe, or maybe not even that. They really are kind of, uh, you know, I, I kind of, I guess what research is, it's, it's teaching, it's self-teaching, it's self, you know, you have to, you have a question, you need to answer it, you do some experiments. So research at the heart of the matter is education. It's, it's educating yourself, the species, about, you know, trying to fill up your knowledge book and learn as much as you can about nature and the universe. Um, that's what research is, it's teaching. Um, and and, and so, so that's what I love about, about uh, you know, you talk, like, again, you kind of talked about teaching science versus doing research. I really kind of view it all kind of mixed up and mashed together and it's, and it's one and the same. So um, to be a good researcher, you gotta be a good teacher, you gotta do some teaching to be a good teacher in the sciences. It helps to have a lab. We don't all have that luxury, but uh, it certainly helps to have a lab and do the teaching in a lab environment um, more than, let's say, a classroom lecture environment. Um, so that's what I that's, that's what I like about it. This is this kind of this kind of pure educational endeavor um, of, of like creating new knowledge and and disseminating that knowledge. So I guess that's so from that I guess we can conclude that you know you enjoy being an FRI <coughs> professor, right? And. What do you expect to see from your students when they walk into I guess, your FRI lab? What do you want them to take when they walk out of it at the end of okay. the semester? Okay, right, right, that's a good question because when I, what I see when I come in or what I assume when I come in is this is blank slates. Like, you know, maybe you've had some preparation here and there, but I try to, but no, but very few people have done like molecular genetics research. So I assume blank slates. What they come out of, uh, what they come out of, uh, what I hope they come out with it is, it's oh, a good question. There's a lot of things I hope they come out with it. Um, cause, cause, because to be realistic, not everybody's going to become a research scientist or a plant geneticist. That's just not realistic. I'm not here to try to convert everybody to be plant geneticists. Um, that wouldn't be right, first of all. So what I so at a kind of fundamental level, what I hope people get out of it. Well, first of all, if you plug into this kind of inquiry-based, kind of research-based learning, um, you come away with just uh, hopefully a much better skill set for tackling any problems anywhere. You learn to like think on your feet. Um, you're no longer in this environment, educational environment, where there is a known answer, and if only you had access to the right textbook or whatever, you get that answer, or if only you studied it. Um, I hope students, uh, one of the things I, I, I kind of try to break my students of when they get here is this idea of like, um, how am I doing? Am I behind? Am I gonna get an A? What, what's my grade gonna be because I dropped my sample? You know, or, or, you know, they're always asking if, if I'm behind because something didn't go right. I'm like, well, we're, we're doing stuff for real. Um, it's just, it is what it is. You are where you need to be. As long as you come in a lab and put it in the work, things may go your way, things may not. And we're going to keep trying at it until we succeed. Uh, so one mentality, uh, you know, I, I hope students kind of uh, shed when they get here, is this idea that there is a known answer and that you have to be, you know, at a certain place at a certain time all the time. Um, that 
that, uh, that it's okay to just completely fall flat on your face and then just get yourself back up and, and try again. Um, it sounds corny or cliche, but that, you know, it, it, it's from these trial and error, from these failures from which you actually learn something. Uh, some of my best students um, are the ones that struggle the most early on because they get real good at, guess what, troubleshooting. They get real good at thinking it through. Sometimes students come in here and they, they do good work and they're working hard and they maybe did pay attention, they read the protocol ahead of time, but everything seems to go right for them and they just sail from one procedure to the next, but they're kind of missing out. They're not really getting good at like when something happens, like, oh, now what do I do? Like everything just worked the first time. And they seem like they're really good and they're really proud of themselves. And some of the other students look at them like, oh, they're so far ahead. Am I behind? Am I going to fail? But what they don't realize is that they're struggling with something. There's no better way to, to, to uh, learn it. So what I hope students are uh, learning or come away from is that is to not, not like kind of fear the challenge or like challenge is something to avoid. Challenge is, you're supposed to celebrate challenge. You know, in this country, we're kind of taught like, Failure is bad and success is good, right? Like, you know, just, but, but in other cultures like Japanese, what they really value or what they really emphasize is the struggle. It's the struggle that's good. And it's the, it's the, uh, the, 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 the painful kind of, you know, learning uh, uh, activities. The, the, it's the struggle you should value. It's from the struggle that you get good. It's from the struggle that you become stronger or more intelligent or you, you figured out how to, you know, do these things. So an easy victory, you know, an easy success doesn't teach you anything and it doesn't make you better. But a hard fought one, maybe one where you didn't even kind of, you fell short of the mark, but you fought hard to like learn and get there and do this thing. That person's gonna be much better situated, uh, you know, mentally, intellectually. Um, so hopefully students come away with just that kind of new way of, uh, of approaching problems or academics for that matter, as not this like, you know, I, I'm going to try to find the easy route. Um, the easy victory is great. Um, ooh, challenge, that's icky, you know, that's tough. Um, so hopefully they, they come away with that uh, kind of mentality of just being able to kind of like slog through stuff, and be persistent, and, uh, and be patient and tenacious. And, uh, and, and yeah, and, and work for something other than the great. Like your motivation, you're at college now, your motivation has to change. Uh, it, it's a hard habit to get out of because of our educational system where you know the grade is the carrot and it's the carrot and stick of grades you know a's f's whatever um at some point your motivation has to change in life because at some point you're going to stop taking exams uh, and so what's the motivation so hopefully I, I, I try to teach my students that you know your motivation in the lab should come from somewhere else other than than, than the grade you're going to make and and like i said i kind of have it easy being in the lab in the lab you get to do projects and you get to take ownership of something and, and it's, it's a puzzle and it's unknown outcomes. And so there is this really rich opportunity to have this other motivation besides the grade. So I, I almost think I have easy in a research lab to kind of foster that mentality in students. But in a lecture class, it's kind of hard uh, to, to, I mean, how do you take a grade off the table? <laughs> in a lecture <laughs> class, you don't, you just gotta have the grade. Uh, not that we don't have grades in here, but, but there are other ways to assess students in a lab than just by taking quizzes and exams and writing papers and stuff like that. Um, it's, you know, effort. I, I have a lab log, I can see how often you've been in here. I live in the lab, so I can see you come in and out every day. Some students get really excited and we have a lot of really good conversations. So that's what I hope students come away with. It's just that kind of shift, that mental shift from kind of like what you were doing in elementary and high school and maybe even your early college years to, to be more like a working professional and have that mindset of like, we have a task, we have a job, we don't have a clear cut maybe manual or solution. Yeah, it's gonna be tough, but that's okay. I'm okay with it, and we're gonna like get it done. So hopefully that kind of attitude happens. Okay. What? Say bye to the camera. Say bye to the camera. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>